Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I am here with special guest James Maskell, and I think you'll find this particularly helpful and interesting content, especially as our world has just come out of, of a pandemic with isolation and lack of community. One of the solutions um, we're going to talk about today is how connecting with other people, especially in the midst of chronic illness, is one of the biggest and most important solutions that we have to offer. And James has some really important information to share with us. Um, just a quick note, if you've missed any other episodes, you can find all of them on YouTube on my channel or iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And uh, you can listen to all those hundred plus episodes at your leisure. And now I would like to introduce my guest, James Maskell. Um, he has uh, been known with so many different things, but he's on a mission to flatten the curve of healthcare costs. He's spent the past decade innovating at the cross section of functional medicine and community. And we're going to talk a lot about that today, so stay tuned. To that end, he created the Functional Forum, the world's largest integrative medical conference with record-setting participation online and growing physician communities around the world. And James, I've been a part of that. You do a fantastic job. Um, and I, I just love when you do those functional forums, the up-level, the level of even just the excitement, the music, the way you um, produce it is um, really great because I think we can do things in functional medicine and integrative medicine that really set the bar. And you're one of those people who's always set the bar. So let me go on. Um, he, his organization and bestselling book of the same name, Evolution of Medicine, prepares health professionals for this new era of personalized participatory medicine. His new project, Heal Community, follows his second book, The Community Cure, and makes it easy for clinics and health systems to deliver lifestyle-focused care effectively and frictionlessly. He is in demand as a speaker and featured on TED Med, HuffPost Live, and TEDx, as well as lecturing internationally. He lives in the Sierra Nevadas with his wife and two daughters. So James, welcome and thank you for joining me uh, today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. Great to be here with you. And uh, yeah, just excited to be here on your channel. I've had you you know, so many times on the Evolution of Medicine because uh, such a great uh, advocate for the medicine and I know a mentor to so many doctors in our community. So grateful to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. So I always love to start, James, is like, how did you get to this path? Because the journey is always a little bit uh, curved along the way. And I'd love to hear just how, basically, how did you get where you're at today? You've got books, you've got speeches, you've got all kinds of things you've done. And now we've landed with community, which we'll come back to. But tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, it actually kind of starts in community too. So I was born in a, a, a intentional community not far from where you live, right? I was born in Loveland, Colorado, randomly. And um, I grew up in England and my parents were part of this sort of intentional community. And I didn't realize until I went to school, but the healthcare that I got growing up was actually very different than most people got. I saw a chiropractor and a homeopath and you know, um, I didn't know it at the time, but that little valley where where I where I was in in um, in, in northern Colorado is an organic valley. Like, there's never wow. been any pesticides in that wow. whole in that whole valley. So, I just that was normal. And then I went to school, and I remember being one day going to see the nurse and looking up and seeing there was just a sticky note and it said, "James Maskell, do not give antibiotics without permission to mother." And there was no other notes. It wasn't like everyone had a note. There was only one note. And I was like, okay, so I guess no one else has asked for that. So that just yeah. stuck in my mind. And then, you know, as years went by, I thought my parents were insane. And I thought, you know, the regular world was normal and my parents were just odd and didn't really think much more of it. And I went on a normal path towards, I don't know, being an investment banker. I did a degree in economics. Mm -hmm. And on that, in that degree, I kind of realized you know, just looking at the numbers, we're in my lifetime, we were going to be in serious trouble with the cost of chronic illness. Yeah. And, you know, I came out of that, I took a job and I thought, this is what you do. You work for a bank. And about six months into it, I realized this is not what you do. And I just had a moment realizing like there's something about my, you know, my childhood and it was kind of relevant. And I wanted to like pursue something that was interesting. And I also kind of knew at that point that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had seen my cousin run businesses and it just looked like a lot more fun than what I was seeing in the bank. So I quit my job, which was like a very sort of elevated path towards, yeah. you know, financial success and mm -hmm. I quit my job and I moved to rural Georgia to try and understand chronic illness like where does it come from is it reversible and under what circumstances is it reversible 
So that was uh, 17 years ago. So 2005, I was 24, moved yeah. to America. And the first thing I did is I worked in a clinic and I saw a provider, you know, very similar to you working there. And I saw chronic disease being reversed and it was amazing. So I worked there for a year and a half. I was kind of running the clinic. Yeah. Um, there was a doctor who was sort of like the head clinician and, you know, not overnight, but in three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, I saw people one, visibly different right like a very different looking person that i had yeah. seen the first time and also you know no longer on their medication and um you know very excited about this journey that they'd gone on and I, I kind of because i was also in the world simultaneously i realized like not many people know that this is possible or happening um you know that doctor was a great devotee of, of dr mercola yeah. in 2005 that was like a a strong source of information for you know providers like you and the doctors like that and he was running his practice and that was the beginning you know that was the very beginning of starting to think okay chronic disease is reversible under the right circumstances and then the next thing i wanted to know is like is this a one-off or are there other people doing yes. this and that was the sort of the beginning of the next part Wow. That, I love that because you like were immersed and clearly you have a systems uh, like processes mind uh, with their background. And then with this, because what I've seen from my perspective, looking in at you is you see a problem and you like have great ideas for solutions and not everybody that may seem really simple because it comes so natural for you. But I think you see these big pictures and you see you forecast, you like probably believe the financial background, you're very good at looking into the future and saying, this is where we're headed. And if we don't change or do something differently. So I already see that in you and you've done it in many different areas, but clearly way back then you were already looking and saying, there's some, this is different. And I have to laugh about your family and what you just shared, because I grew up in a similar kind of thing. My mom was a nurse and very holistic minded. We had a, like a half acre garden. So we had a lot of our own food and I didn't know it was any different, but I remember the dentist, like we didn't get x-rays, we didn't get fluoride. <laughs> and, you know, I was this weird kid that like, what is wrong with you that you don't get a lot of x-rays on your teeth every year. And, and granted now probably that's the minimal exposure of all the rest of the exposures we get. But I remember those things, just like your note with the nurse, I had these things that my mom didn't let me get x-rays and we didn't get fluoride treatment. <laughs> yeah. so totally get the childhood well, how thing. grateful are we now the yeah. foresight you know like how yeah. how did my mom in 1987 yeah. you know could how could she predict the downside of the overuse of antibiotics by like 30 years i mean it's amazing and, it and really the, answer, is. the answer is holism right the answer is being able yeah. to see that every action has an equal and opposite reaction and if you you know if you kill off all the bugs then there's going to be some downstream you know side effect it wasn't science at that yeah. point but it was logical yes yes and i love that that both of our mothers actually kind of followed their heart and they did they actually created in us this not only passion but probably a little bit more resilience in our physical bodies too um so from there you obviously got excited and you started to see when did you like connect with and i love that you use personalized there's functional there's all these terms now and i think that all of the directions integrative was kind of the old term it went to functional now it's more pre precision personalized and the word that you used in your bio was participatory so how did you find functional like the crowd the crew the tribe after that clinic well so yeah then i took a job basically selling to doctors like you because i wanted to one i wanted to learn and someone convinced me that the best way to learn and also to make money was to go and sell because I could go and ask questions and I got some sales training and I had a mentor. Mm -hmm. So I took a job with a supplement company that sold to doctors. And so, you know, my, 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 my sort of base was acupunctures, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, nutritionists, and every so often a medical doctor who would sort of jump ship. Yeah. And, and so basically the next six years was the deepest broadest understanding of, of all of that stuff right from ayurveda homeopathy naturopathy integrative functional even the payment yep. systems yep. insurance like the licenses the state-to-state -state different shifts like i learned it all and i put a hundred thousand miles on my car in the first wow. three years I, my territory was Virginia to Maine. So I had the whole, wow. board, <laughs> and I learned, I just got the deepest understanding. And that also included me putting on a little events for practitioners. Yeah. I realized straight away that like clinical knowledge in this space was this sort of black hole or black box where you could never know enough. It was always changing, always moving. And there was just an unlimited amount to know. So I realized like, okay, I'm going to sit in the lectures and I'm going to learn as much as I can. But ultimately what I saw was that, it just so happened that the clinic that I had worked with first 
was very, very, very well organized. And everywhere else that I went seemed very, very, very disorganized. And so my gift was to come in and say, hey, I'll help you like work out how to run this properly, marketing and yeah. you know patient flow, but you've got to use all my sp- supplements. Yeah. So I was good at selling it and I you know, started making some money. I was on commission. And then eventually I moved to New York two years into it. And then in, in 2010, um, was the first time that I went to a proper conference. It was the Integrated Healthcare Symposium in New York. And that's when I saw Jeff Bland speak for the first time. And I'd heard of him and I'd heard people talk about him and I'd heard about functional medicine, but I didn't really know what it was. And as I sat there, I was like, you know, I could see that unlike everything else that I'd done up until that point, most of the people in that room were MDs and they were like hanging on his every word. And I was like, okay, this, this is interesting. And as I went back to that conference every year, what I started, I started to learn more about functional medicine. And the thing that really clinched it for me in 2013, I sort of realized, I think functional is going to be the one or is the most valuable is because I saw Christy Hughes present and I saw for the first time, the matrix and the timeline and everything. And I just realized like, what I'd seen so many places is that because all of these different providers had their own little weird language yeah. and they didn't speak the other languages, there wasn't really like a unifying something yeah. for all of these people to come together. And I saw that ultimately these groups needed to be unified because ultimately yeah. this was the future of medicine, like, you yes. know, creating health was the future of medicine. So in, around that time, I started thinking about functional medicine and then at, right at the end of, of 2013, I'd put on probably a hundred events for practitioners over those six years from, you know, 10 person events in yoga studios to little events in hotels and everything in between. And I, I, I had started, I'd had an opportunity to like get some speaking gigs as a practice management speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I realized like, I'm not going to wait for, to get picked, to pick on some stages. I'm going to make a new stage. And that stage was the functional forum. So February, 2014, we had Daft Punk as the intro music. We yeah. had Kelly Brogan as the speaker on the first one. I was the host. Yeah. And we tried to create something cool and fun yeah. and aspirational so that if a doctor watched it, they'd be like, oh, I want to do this. This yeah. looks cool. And that was that was the initial energy of the Functional Forum. That was nine years into the plan at that point. Wow. Well, and that's what I was coming on in the beginning. It's like the production was like top notch. And a lot of times in this field, boring lectures, boring slides, there's not a lot of production. The content's good, but you took that to a new level. And I think you were one of the first people who did it and it did really attract. I also love that you're um, saying that future in my perspective, a little bit similar in the sense of there's this allopathic medicine I trained in, but I always knew I wanted to kind of combine the best of both worlds. And I remember seeing, you know, Dr. Andrew Wiles program and all these alternative, they called it in the, you know, 80s and 90s and it but it wasn't connected it was this or this and they were very dichotomous in like we don't like these guys you know there was like not this connection and I remember thinking which a lot of docs are just like me I'm not unique but I remember thinking I want to infiltrate the system this is the best reimbursed system at this moment it's still not very good we're going to go there in a minute but this is a system that is predominant still in the U.S. and I want to change the trajectory of the system, which is kind of aligned with what you're saying. And the big thing about functional medicine was for the first time, it wasn't something that I referred to a massage therapist or an acupuncturist or referred out. And I knew that that existed. It was actually something that I did as an allopathic doctor in the uh, detective work of solving the patient's problem. So it was the first time that I had tools that I could use in the office and expand my previous toolbox of just surgeries and medication. So love that you frame that. And then again, bringing people together. So functional forum, highly successful. Again, I've, I've been lucky to be part of that several times. Then where did it go from there? Cause you wrote the evolution of medicine and then Tell, take us from there to there. Yeah, so, you know, about three years into it, we built this big audience. We're really the first people to put functional medicine education online for free. Then it was like, okay, what, you know, ha, you know, I guess what I was seeing was there were a lot of doctors out there that were coming to the trainings, but still had a day job doing normal medicine. And I was like, we got to speed that up. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's just around that same time, I had sort of because of the content that we created, it was sort of clear that, you know, the, things had changed and maybe you could actually build a practice for a lot less capital yeah. than it used to because you could do a lot of stuff online. You could do e-prescribe on the supplements and you could have an online scheduler. And so like all these things that used to be like 
extra capital requirements to start a new practice it was kind of maybe easier and you could start one off a laptop you know in a co-working space yeah. and so i wrote the book the evolution of medicine and the goal was if i gave it to a doctor you know would they would they read it and think i want to do that same kind of idea right yeah. let's try and let's try and accelerate this and make it easier for doctors to start their own practice doing it so that was 2016 sort of three years into it the forum's still going we did a bunch of like virtual summits and that kind of thing um i took a couple of years where i started to really think about like i've always been interested in sort of like this cross section of community and functional medicine yeah. so you know the functional forum became a worldwide network of, of meetups and it still is that of doctors getting together um i took a sort of a, a sort of a moment where i felt okay what is you know maybe maybe the biggest issue is that everyone's insurance sends people to allopathic doctors first what if we could have an alternative to health insurance where people could see you know a natural uh, provider or a functional medicine provider as their first port of call and that was new health which exists right now k-n-e-w health um and it was cool but again I, I kind of got into it and i realized like it's not quite what i want to be doing like I, I, what i really care about and what coming back to the original vision is yep. How can we reverse chronic illness at the scale that it exists? Yes. And it exists everywhere and it's only growing and it's yeah. getting worse. And, you know, that took me to a place where I realized like the one thing that I had seen, like ultimately, if, if every doctor became a Jill Carnahan, you know, it would be, you know, there would be an incredible standard of care, but there's also like a resource mismatch, right? Yeah. In that functional medicine delivered in the way that it's currently delivered, you know, it's too slow yeah. to like become a standard of care and therefore not everyone could get it. Yeah. And so it's just and like, James, there's a just really could put that in perspective for the listener. For example, when I did family medicine, I saw 30 to 40 patients a day. Now at a really, really, really busy day, I see eight to 10 patients. So you can just yeah. put that into context. I wanted to frame it. And that's really, that's a lot of patients for the average function medicine. And some of them see three or four a day. So yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, it's valuable and look, people need it obviously. And you do, and it's incredible that, you know, people with, you know, really tough chronic illnesses can recover under, you know, that kind of support. But ultimately, like if you want to flatten the curve of healthcare yeah. costs, right, we've got to think in a different way. Yes. And so the one thing that I had seen during all of my time that really resonated for solving that mission was essentially group group models yeah. of care where groups of people could support each other in implementing these protocols and getting better and so i wrote the second book i wrote on it's called the community cure it's right here okay. and you know when i wrote that in 2019 my plan was i was going to go to all these hospitals and i was going to say hey look you should be doing it and now it can be profitable and it can be scalable and you don't need to hire so many doctors and look the cleveland clinic is yeah. doing it and all of that and then COVID hit and it was like there's no groups there's no alcoholics anonymous there's no overeaters anonymous there's no functional medicine groups at the cleveland clinic because people can't sit in a room together and while that was like initially um a big barrier what i kind of realized too is that it, a, a new world was opening up where maybe it was possible to do it online and that's what i've been doing for the last two years now is is what we've created as a way for mainstream health system so hospitals yeah. big clinic allopathic doctors to sort of deliver i'm calling it like functional medicine light yeah right so it's, it's the behavior change it's the yeah. food it's the stress it's the sleep <laughs> all the things that are sort of like the minimum viable yeah. protocol that you give and and deliver that to as many people as possible and that's that's where we are today I love it. So say I'm a doc, I'm in, you know, Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic, and I maybe have heard a little bit about this and I'm overwhelmed with patient load and patient compliance, and I want to help more people. If I were to ask you, you know, James, what do you have to offer? Tell me more about this community cure. How would you describe it to me as far as how could it be implemented or used by someone like, you know, a doc who hasn't really done a, you know, purely functional model or someone like me who has? Tell me yeah, more. well, for, for like, you know, like you said, like the average doctor who, you know, what, here's what I found, Jill, is that only about five or 10% of doctors have really got their head around what functional medicine is. Yeah. But 99% of doctors know that they want their patients to do the healthy behaviors. Yeah. They just don't know how to do it. There's no plan. It's like, mm -hmm. they don't have any support system, right? When you do a, a, a prescription, yeah. there's a pharmacy and there's a pharmacist and there's a, you know, text you every five minutes to get yeah. your refill. There's a whole system to right. remind you to do that thing. Whereas if, if you say, hey, 
you know, you've got to change the way you sleep. You've got to change the way you eat. You've got to, you know, get a uh, supportive community. You've got to like, you know, go to bed early. You've got to, you know, do these meditative practices. Good luck. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there's no support structure. So what we've provided and what we've created is essentially uh, a completely scalable support structure where any doctor could now say, OK, I'm going to have this. I'm going to prescribe it. Yeah. And we take care of all the details of running yeah. it. The doctor makes money, so they're happy. And ultimately, you know, the, the insurance pays for it and even Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really about trying to find a way to yeah. give this kind of care to patients, because what we've seen is that once patients get into a community of other people that are like also searching for health, that they sort of le- they just learn from each other. And, you know, one of them will say, oh, you got to follow Jill Carnahan. And then suddenly they're listening to your podcast and they're learning from all your guests. And what you really just need to do is sort of flip that switch into yeah. participation, into participatory medicine. And then there's, you know, then the, the sort of they're on their own trajectory and, and this community supports that. So, you know, one of the biggest things that we found is that when you look at people who, who, who have a chronic illness, the number one thing is that it's very isolating to have a chronic illness because you can't interact with the normal social structures of pizza and beer night on Friday if you're trying to reverse your autoimmune condition. And so by creating new communities and, and helping those communities thrive together, um, you know, the name of this podcast is is the quickest and easiest way to heal from a chronic illness. It's to yeah. be with other people and do it together. Wow. Brilliant. And it so goes with the data supports. I mean, we've known from AA years ago of why the success of groups like that is because all of a sudden people who have similar things, but they think they're all alone and they're overwhelmed. They give, come together and they number one, hear stories of like, oh my gosh, you're just like me. You're struggling with that too. And then number two, they often have ideas and those ideas help each other because they're new and different. And, and then again, that community essence is just, I think this is absolutely the future. So you mentioned something and glossed kind of over, but I wanted to pause and go back reimbursement. That's huge. You said this group is reimbursable. Are insurers and Medicare, Medicaid um, just becoming more aware that groups do work and how have you gotten reimbursement for this? just following the rules you know yeah. like yeah. the rules changed in 2021 and it allowed if you think creatively yeah. a yeah. way to you know have this yeah. happen mm-hmm. and we you know i'd spent enough time around the previous rules yeah. because i've been helping doctors to run group visits you know for a long time mm-hmm. and yeah in t- january 2021 because of the pandemic yeah. a number of things really changed that gave the doctors more flexibility yeah. and many Many doctors chose to interpret those rules in many different ways, yeah. but I saw an opportunity where we could like, you know, have where we could sort of attach ourselves to an existing clinic. Mm-hmm. They could just prescribe the group. We could run the group. We have become like an extension of their yeah. care team. And so that's how we're running it so far. If people are listening to this and you want to join one of those groups, if you go to healcommunity.com and you let us know where you're from, we'll, you know, tell you if one, you know, opens up in your area because, you know, we're trying as hard as we can to get as many doctors as possible doing it, you know, primary care, family medicine. Um, We recently just signed our first hospital system. Um, So, you know, we're on the path and, you know, the good news is, is that the incentives line up, right, for the hospital system they can actually make more money prescribing this group than prescribing drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think a lot of times the system has worked to kind of reduce access to this kind of care. And I think just in the way that we're doing it, we've kind of like um, aligned all the incentives in the right way to get people this kind of care. James, that's tremendous. Cause that's again, usually there's one hang up with reimbursement or this or that. And, and the fact that, and interesting how this goes, this is how life tends to be, right? The pandemic, which could have been this like, oh my gosh, we have this community cure and it's not going to happen because no one's talking anymore. But the truth is it actually opened up a door in 2021 with the new legislation that actually, what, did it make it more accessible virtually? Is that part of the, yeah. yeah. Part of it is the virtual care is, is reimbursed the same as in-person care. And then part of it is that um there's there's rules around like what actually has to what does the physician have to do face to face and what else can the team do got it okay so in our model it's actually health coaches who run the group and the provider is really just there in small increments to um, monitor your medication and actually works quite well like we've had 
as an example, like we've had chronic pain groups, right? Before the pandemic came along, chronic pain was the biggest yeah. issue in America, Oxycontin, you know, um, overuse of opiates. So in this model, a group of people can work together on their pain. They, you know, pain is biopsychosocial. Lonely mm -hmm. people actually have higher pain scores. Yeah. So, you know, that they, and then they're working on their sleep and their stress and their food, their eating an anti-inflammatory diet reducing the pain but also that doctor is checking in every month and saying hey maybe yeah. you can move to a lower dose or maybe you can come off and that's that's amazing like that's right. that's what i'm here for tremendous so you mentioned healcommunity.com we'll of course link all the in the show notes or wherever you're watching or listening to this you'll have access to the web links but i just want to repeat that that would be patient maybe in their area looking for you know a group and if you have one you can connect them but more importantly if you're a physician a provider a mid-level anyone that's listening and they're like i would love to have this for my patients why don't you talk for just a minute to the provider like what can you offer how do they connect with you tell us a little bit about that if you're a provider yeah, I mean get in touch a heal community ultimately you know i recognize that there's a lot of um friction in changing anything mm -hmm. right i called my first book the evolution of medicine and i guess i expected it to happen quickly like okay as soon as doctors get it it'll just happen yeah and and ultimately what i came to realize is there's a lot of institutional friction that sort of slows this down and so forth but you know, what we've created here at Heal Community, you know, maximizes the practitioner's time, makes money for either the provider or the institution or the group, um, is, a, is, is, you know, really efficient, and more than anything, takes the weight of behavior change off your shoulders yeah. and puts it onto the group, right? And that's the, the beauty of it. I think a lot of doctors feel like under the weight of the fact that they know their patients are not doing the healthy behaviors they want them to. Yeah. And ultimately what we've created is sort of like the prescription by which they can do that. And um, the group is unique in the fact that um, what happens in the group is that there are different personality types and those different personality types kind of like egg each other on and support yeah. each other. So you have some people that will come out the blocks quickly and some people that are just not so sure and need to see other people do it first, but that naturally happens in the, in the group. But yeah, you know, if you get in touch with your community, we've got um, a, a team of implementation team that can like see if it's a good fit for your practice, but pretty much if you bill insurance and you're a physician in America, we can work with you. Awesome. So last thing is just, you've been very clearly good at forecasting future. Like you see, I see you as a visionary because you can see these down the road. Like I see this problem, here's a solution and come at it that way. But um, any thoughts about where you think, I, I guess one thing is just that COVID could have been a really disaster and it has been in some ways, but it also opened a door, I think for this kind of medicine, this kind of providing and also community to be on the forefront. What do you see in the next five years, James? Yeah, so it could be. It is. It is simultaneously a disaster and, yeah. and an amazing opportunity, right? In that, like, obviously, there's a lot. There's a huge mental health crisis that's coming off the back of it. Groups are really the only way to solve that because there's not a million more therapists, right? But there are coaches and support. I mean, I've been part of a men's group for three years, and I've seen tremendous outcomes in that group with no medical yeah. potential at all, you know? So we have to take advantage of this community theme. What I would say, Jill, is the big theme that's happening in medicine is that forever, doc, well, for not forever, but for the last 40 years, doctors have been paid for what they do. Yeah. And what's starting to happen is doctors are gonna get paid for what happens to their patients. Yeah. Yeah. And that shift towards, you know, being paid for keeping people healthy, essentially, I think is going to usher in an amazing new era where functional medicine becomes the standard of care, because if you now get paid for keeping people well, then, you know, the kind of medicine that you've been, you know, leading and, and, and practicing becomes a lot more valuable, because if you can get people off medication, if you can get people to not see the doctor so much, that's how you will start yeah. to make money. And that is a is a 180 degree shift in the way that medicine is run. And so I'm excited to see that those practitioners that really um, are able to get people well and keep people well will rise to the top. Oh, I love that. And, and just a final little story here. It reminds me back I, when I first got out of residency, I started with the hospital system. I helped them create an integrated medical center. I was medical director. All was well until one day I sat in a board meeting and I was the executive director of that department. And they were showing on the screen each department and how many beds they had filled the last month, right? And I remember just looking at that and my heart sank and I'm like, crap. <laughs> 
this is not going to be long-term good because I'm trying to keep people out of the hospital and they're, they're, you know, departmental, like, uh, how they raise the departments was based on beds filled in the hospital. So what you're saying is there's a, that that's old school, right? Things are shifting. We're no longer wanting to fill beds in the hospital, we're wanting to keep them out of the hospital. And I love that because it's come full circle. That was about, I don't know, 12 years ago. And I think things are shifting in that direction. Thank goodness, because I remember just sitting there going, oh, my way of medicine is not yet going to fit into this system. And again, things are turning and shifting, but that's exactly what you're saying. Um, James, love, love this content, love the, what you're doing. I'm so excited to have you here just because I want to support you. We'll get this out to as many listeners and practitioners as we can. Any last final words of wisdom? Yeah, well, look, one thing I'm excited to do, and I don't know whether it's coming next year or some point, you know, I've always thought the American um, pharma commercials are so crazy, right? So yeah. it's like, you know, ask your doctor if this might be ready for you. So expect coming soon. You know, ask your doctor if uh, he, if running a heal community might be right for you, and that I think you love know, what it. I'd love to do is to get like people who really care and who want to be activated and want to be like a community health advocate to get in there, go and speak to doctors and get this going because ultimately the knock-on effects to society of yeah. having people in these pods and helping each other get better is powerful. Like we've been isolated. Every group yeah. has been split in two because of COVID. There's a chance that we're in like this, you know, mass formation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the only way back, I think, is to actually be with each other. And I think health is a, is a topic where I've seen examples where people of vastly different backgrounds can actually get together and work together because there's sort of a, a thing that they're working on together. Yeah. And that is getting each other healthy. So I hope that this can be a vehicle for solving problems beyond chronic illness. Love it. Love it. Love it. We'll keep up the great work. Always great to talk to you, James. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.